just join in. So um, I think we should grant just a minute or two, not more than that, please. Just allow others to join. So let's just grant two minutes. Or I work at I work at uh, Ferreti Chung Hospital Casino. I'm the vice president one of Afemson and also the chairman of the educational committee of uh, Afemson. So I want to welcome all our teachers, you know, colleagues, colleagues, students, and all other distinguished ladies and gentlemen to this webinar organized by the scientific, uh, by the educational committee of Afemson. The meaning of Afemson is the Association of Fetal Medicine Specialists of Nigeria. And today, we'll be discussing an important topic because we know that uh, postpartum hemorrhage is a major killer of a woman and has actually uh, been uh, marked as the commonest cause of maternal mortality worldwide. It therefore means that all health workers that conduct deliveries need to have updated knowledge and skills in order to manage postpartum hemorrhage, if it occurs. And we all know that every woman who is delivering a baby is at risk of developing postpartum hemorrhage. We therefore believe that this webinar will be useful, not only to doctors, but also nurses, midwives, students, and any other person involved in taking care of women. Uh, our presenter today is indeed a distinguished senior colleague, teacher, and mentor to a number of us. Uh, she's a professor of obstetrics and gynecology working at Aminu Kano Teaching Hospital, Kano and also the director of the African Center for Population Health and Policy at the Bayer University, Kano. Um, and importantly, she's also a strong member of this association at FEMSIM. And she was specifically chosen to make this presentation because she's one of the researchers that generated the evidence that made the WHO update the guideline, which we're going to be talking about today. So, we can say that today we'll be hearing from the horse's mouth. Um, so since we're all here to learn, please uh, let's put our um, microphone in silent mode and uh, listen. And then um, once we finish, well, uh, if you have any question, you can put it in the chat box. And then once we finish, um, there'll be opportunities to uh, read out those questions uh, for her to answer. Uh, I would say that after her presentation also, we'll take a very short presentation about um, Afemson. So join me in welcoming our senior colleague, teacher, mentor, and researcher, uh, Professor Hadiza Galanenchi, and uh, she can now proceed with her presentation. So Prof. Hadiza, please go ahead. Thank you. You are welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jamil Tuku. Uh, <clears throat> you, you introduce yourself from uh, Kasana, uh, is it a uh, uh, university? But you know you're, you're actually from Amina Kano Teaching Hospital by University Kano. You can't run away from that. All right, so we just loaned you for a while, but you're coming back home, uh, hopefully. Uh, so a very good, uh, uh, well, I, I, I'm used to saying afternoon, morning, because that's usually if you're doing uh, more of an international presentation, but I think most of us are Nigerians, so a very good evening to all of us and uh, uh, to very senior colleagues that are uh, in this uh, uh, webinar, uh, uh, as well as uh, our teachers, our students, our mentees, and our mentors. Um, as uh, stated by uh, Professor uh, Jamil, we're going to be talking about the updated WHO recommendations for PPH care and uh, uh, management. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Jamilo, can you just read? Yes, up? we yeah. can see. Okay, excellent. Um, uh, so, so the my presentation will go uh, first of all trying to just remind us of the process of how WHO uh, uh, um, makes a recommendation, uh, so that we know the uh, uh, you know the process uh, that took place before we got to where we are today. And then uh, uh, I will take you through the recommendations of uh, uh, the new recommendations of WHO and how did we get to that uh, new recommendations? Uh, uh, so that's how we're going to go. I will try to be very fast. I asked uh, Professor Jamil yesterday how much time I have. Uh, uh, really, 
uh, if we're really going to go into details, it would take us more than 30 minutes, but I will try and make it within uh, 30 minutes. So if you have questions, in case I don't explain things very well, just put them in the chat and then we can discuss. Um, now, when WHO is going to bring out a new recommendation or is going to update its own recommendation, it usually takes years. It takes months to years. In fact, uh, I, I heard from the horse's mouth from one of the WHO that the earliest they've gotten a rec an updated recommendation was about six months. But I would tell you, this particular recommendation took place, I mean, the updated recommendation from around May to probably early uh, December. That was how fast they were able to get this recommendation. And this is because of the importance of what we're discussing. So there are processes. There is a stated process which is, uh, uh, which is um, uh, clearly identified at the WHO Handbook for Guideline Development. And they have to go through all those processes. And the steps start with what are the priority questions? So for example, in, in this particular case of uh, PPH, are there, is there evidence that using correct measurement of PPH compared to the visual uh, inspection doesn't make a difference? So you, you have to have a priority question looking at the PICO, P-I-C-O, so that you can actually do evidence, look for systematic reviews. So there were two systematic reviews in this particular recommendation. One looking at the accurate measurement and the other one looking at the bundle approach of treatment. And then when they get the systematic reviews, and you know, there are groups of people that are, are responsible for this. So researchers are given this responsibility of looking at the systematic reviews and bringing evidence out. Now, when they bring this evidence, we have what to call the, uh, uh, the, the uh, I think they call them the guideline development group. Oh, oh, and in nice. guideline yeah. development group, I go? please, can we all have, uh, maybe the secretary can mute people. Uh, sorry. So, so, so this guideline development group, and it involves all the stakeholders, every single stakeholder that you know, whether it's a midwife, whether it's a gynecologist, whether it's a researcher, whether it's a partner, whether it's women themselves, whether it's NGO, they come in as a group. And based on the synthesis, based on the systematic reviews, can somebody mute uh, Dr. Yakin? Please, we should put our microphone in silent mode. Yes. Please. We're here to learn. Dr. Yakin AKD, I think okay, is the one yes. I can, yes, I can get it, yeah. So, so you will now, they now synthesize what has been uh, uh, um, collected and they now make recommendations. After the recommendations, you have another group that looks at the recommendation, the steering committee group that looks and see, is it really uh, implementable? And then you even have an external reviewer, another group of external people that come and finally say, yes, this is considering every single, remember WHO does not make recommendation for Nigeria alone or for UK alone or for US alone. It makes recommendation for the world. So they have to consider every single scenario and context before they bring out this recommendation. So that is what happened between the time we uh, presented the result of Emotive, which was first presented at uh, International uh, Maternal Newborn Health Conference at Cape Town in May. Uh, uh, in May, we presented the results. And by December, specifically 21st of December, they launched and presented the WHO recommendations on the assessment of postpartum uh, uh, blood loss and the use of treatment bundle for postpartum hemorrhage. That is the new WHO recommendation. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. Now, when you look at the document, which you can Google at any time and get it and get it uh, online, they started by telling us the, 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 the real burden of, uh, of uh, PPH across the world. And, you know, I was in a, in a, in a uh, meeting in Dubai when we're setting up the PPH roadmap. And the only country that was colored red was Nigeria. The only country. They said, if we're able to reduce maternal mortality from PPH in Nigeria, 
then we'll be back on track getting our SDG free. It was the only country colored red. Even all the countries where you're having all the problems in this world, it's not colored red. So that is our position in the world as far as PPH is concerned. Now, the first recommendation in the guidelines so far now, in the new, the new recommendation, was that for all women, I'm reading it verbatimly, for all women given birth, routine objective measurement of postpartum blood loss is recommended to improve the detection and prompt treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. Methods to objectively quantify blood loss such as calibrated drip for women having vaginal birth can achieve this. So what they're saying is that use calibrated drips to be able to objectively uh, uh, um, quantify the amount of blood loss so that you can immediately start treatment. Now, why did they say so? Because as I said, in that particular document, you see evidence and you see how they came to this. Uh, conclusion. The first thing is that there are three delays that were identified as causing the problem of PPH because we know the interventions. There's not going to be any drug better than an oxytocin to stop bleeding. So we know the intervention. But why is it that we're still having problems? One is that we don't detect it early. It's when a woman starts saying she feels like, you know, she's going to faint or she starts saying she needs water. Then somebody will look at the floor and see that she's lost so much blood, one liter. So one is the missed diagnosis. And that first recommendation is to address this missed diagnosis. The second one and the third one is the second recommendation that addresses the delay in treatment because we give one treatment before we give the other, taking so much time. And then we also take time to escalate and therefore more time for the woman to get into a morbid uh, condition or even probably die. So in terms of this quantification of the blood, we have clearly showed, and this is part of the evidence that they have used in trying to come to this uh, conclusion. They use, I think, about five major studies that have been done to actually come to agreement that really you, we, we delay in estimating. We don't know how to do visual estimation. That's the truth of the matter. So this clearly shows if you just have blood on the floor or you have blood in a container that is not calibrated or you have blood on the cloth, you really don't know how much. And this is, uh, uh, you know, really shown by so many studies. There's one big study, which is the champion trial study, which shows that at 500 mils, 25%, only 25% of women are actually being treated for PPH. And we know the diagnosis is 500 mils. So 75% of women that have lost up to 500 mils, nobody thinks that they have lost up to 500 mils, so they don't get any treatment. And even at one liter, which this uh, uh, diagram is showing, even at one liter, we lose 30% of women. So only 70% get detected at one liter. So a woman loses one liter and somebody will not start out on treatment because he doesn't know she's lost up to 500 mils. So that is it. So there are various methods of actually objective calculation of or objective measurement of blood. And clearly, in this uh, recommendation of WHO, they say you can use anything that can give you objective uh, measurement, but calibrated drip has been shown to actually do the job for you. So the one, this calibrated drip that we have here is actually the one we use for the emotive trial. But there are so many others in terms of reusable ones, in terms of biodegradable ones, and so on and so forth. So WHO is now saying, please use an objective method to calculate the amount of blood so that you now get to the second recommendation. And the second recommendation says that a standardized and timely approach to the management of postpartum hemorrhage, which comprises of one objective assessment with a, and then the use of the treatment bundle. All right? And then thirdly, the implementation strategy. These are the three things that they want us to have as an approach. One, objective management, uh, objective uh, measurement. Two, treatment bundle. Three, implementation strategy. And they say the care bundle for the first line treatment 
of PPA should include one, massage, which is the M in emotive, two, administrative of oxytocin, which is the O in emotive, T, administrative of uh, transdermic acid, which is the T, IV, which is the uh, intravenous fluid, and then examination and escalation, which is the E. So that is what emotive is all about. So you can see that emotive that was trying to address the delays is what they have now used to actually update our, our uh, WHO uh, uh, guidelines. So this is it, the M, the O, the T, the I, the B, the, and the E. And that is exactly what uh, the recommendation is saying. And looking at it here, you can see that the emotive bundle actually addresses all the delays. The E is the early diagnosis. And then the motive bundle is trying to do the treatment all within 15 minutes. What they said in the recommendation is that you can give the motive treatment within 15 minutes. And in fact, they said, whether you give MOT, whether you give MO, MOIVE, whether you give TIVO, the important thing, let our women get this intervention and give them at once. Give all the 15, I mean, all these interventions within 15 minutes. Now, what is the clinical bundle? Because you see bundle mentioned over and over in the, in the guideline. A clinical bundle is just a set of interventions that when you perform them, they give you the results you want. That's just what a clinical bundle is. And there's so many clinical bundles. Even in medicine, they have some clinical bundles for addressing, uh, you know, clinical conditions. So you give certain interventions all at the same time so that you can achieve, uh, uh, you know, the desired uh, uh, effect. So the early detection is our first recommendation. And I, I can, I know all of you, uh, you know, practitioners, I mean, uh, obstetricians and residents and students, what we used to do is the visual estimation. So now what we're saying is use a calibrated drip. And then apart from the calibrated drip, don't forget your clinical impression. At times, a woman will come with, a, with anemia. She doesn't need to lose up to 500 mils before she starts having the complications of PPH. So once you have your clinical judgment that this woman has PPH or she's going to have a complication, please go ahead and trigger the bundle. Don't wait and say, oh, no, I've had you have to go to 500 mils. In fact, for us, we decided at 300 mils in Nigeria. Other countries... They wanted to go to 500. In Nigeria, we said, start at 300. As soon as the woman gets to 300, she's either sweating or her pulse is high or her blood pressure is low or you feel this blood is rushing. Please trigger the bundle. Start MOTIVE. You know, don't wait until you get to 500 mil. So I've said it. You give it all at the same time. If you're the one doing it alone, we know the first thing we say in PPH care, even for students, is call for help. So that as you're giving oxytocin, as somebody is setting up light, somebody is getting the trinosemic acid, somebody is doing this, somebody is massaging, do it all at the same time. If you're only one, do one after the other. If you have hands, all get it done within 15 minutes. Now, forget about sequential treatment. And that is clearly said in the recommendation. You don't do the sequential treatment because you lose time, you lose uh, 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 some some of the interventions are not done, and you know time is of essence. Time is of essence. If you don't give it, a woman is losing. She'll get to a time that even when you can stop it, you can't. She gets into DIC. She gets into renal shutdown and all the other complications. We know the massage. What we do in the massage, we it was very difficult for us to quantify how do you do massage. But we all know what is massage. You feel the uterus flabby. Whoa. You make you massage it and it becomes strong. Remember, talk to your patients when you are when you are doing the massage. Tell them you're doing it because you want to stop them from bleeding. It's very painful. Uh, we have had experience personally. I mean, people have 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 know what it is to have this uh, you know uterus contract. It's very painful. So so do it gently. Tell the woman you have you have to do it for her own sake and tell her to even continue to do it herself. So the massage is there. Make sure you 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 work. In fact, one of the key considerations in the recommendation is talk to your patient, you know, communicate with your patient, have respectful care. These are all in the recommendation. Respectful care, good communication. Let them take the decision. Let it be a 
uh, you know, a, a combined decision with them when you're doing something. I can imagine somebody bleeding and people are just all over her doing this. Bring your hand. Somebody is putting his hand on the uterus. It's usually, it, it, I mean, it's really, really terrible. And at times they go into depression after all this. So please consider it is a human being that you're taking care of. Oxytocin, there is a standard of giving oxytocin. When we're trying to find out, people were given between 10 units to 40 units. Uh, uh, some push, some in 10 minutes, some in 20 minutes. What we're saying is give 10 international units, 500 mils over 10 minutes. All right? And then you now put 20 international units in to run in later over four hours. So there is a standard. There is a standard we need to follow. And then, of course, if you're using misoprostol, go ahead and use misoprostol, especially because we know the quality of oxytocin we have. So you can use misoprostol if you feel the quality of oxytocin you have is not as good. And then remember tranexamic acid. The woman trial showed that a, a, a third of women were saved using tranexamic acid. So please use tranexamic acid. And now, with this, with this uh, WHO recommendation, a midwife, a trained midwife, can give trinosemic acid because it's part of the bundle. And it is part of the tax shifting in Nigeria. Every single midwife, trained midwife, can give IV trinosemic acid. Don't wait for a doctor to have to prescribe it. It's part of the intervention. Once a woman is bleeding, give her all the intervention. All right? Then, of course, the IV, we know that we have IV and you put oxytocin running in the IV. And then if you think she still needs to have, uh, uh, because of the blood volume, then put another IV drug, IV line, so that you can continue to give uh, crystalloid. The E, the last E, which is in the second recommendation, you had that, you know, you have to examine and escalate, all right? And what we are saying is that to examine and escalate, what do you, what do you need? Of course, your placenta has to be examined to make sure it's correct. You have to examine for episiotomies, for cervical tear, for uterine tear, all right, perineal tear. And then when you examine, you now have to treat. And of course, empty the bladder. These are basic obstetric uh, practices. Empty the bladder and make sure that the bladder is empty so that the uterus will contract. So examination and escalation. So in case she, she's still bleeding, despite all this you have done, then think of other things. The thought of you try atony, your bundle will take care of it. You look at the placenta, you look at the laceration and the Coagulopathy. Remember the four T's in the causes of uh, 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 PPH. And then if she's still bleeding, please escalate to the next level. And that next level, of course, we know that is laparotomy. All right? So don't wait. At times we get to laparotomy very late. That by the time you get in to do your, uh, um, your uh, uh, B lynch and so on, the woman can't make it because she's lost so much blood. So don't waste time. Time is of essence. 15 minutes, you've given your bundle. Within the next 15, 30 minutes, you should decide whether this woman get, needs to get, get to the theater or not, if it's not working. Don't wait until it's too late. And of course, blood transfusion if it's uh, required. Now, in the second recommendation I read out, it said that you have to implement, use the implementation strategy. And actually, in the emotive trial, we try to see what will make emotive work. What strategies do you put in place if you want to get emotive to work? And there are four strategies. Number one is that you've got to get all the resources that are required, all the items that are required in one place in labor ward. You can use a trolley and have them there. You can use a carry case and have them there. You can use a kit. I just came out of a webinar, a PPH Community of Practice webinar, and somebody from Abu Dhabi was saying that they have it in a bag, in a kit. And they have their oxytocin, their trinosemic acid, their cannulas, their IV fluids, all in a bag. So they carry that bag to where the patient is and they use it. You have it in a trolley, you push the trolley. You have it in a carry case, you carry the carry case. Everything has to be there. It's not when you want trinosemic acid, you send somebody to go to the pharmacy or even to go outside the hospital to buy trinosemic acid. Or it's when you remember you need IV fluid, you remember you don't have normal saline. And therefore, you have to go to the other ward or to go to the pharmacy or even the matron's office. Everything has to be there. You don't have to go anywhere. Just grab it and use it. The second thing is training, 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 training. People don't like changing their practice. 
all these interventions and the recommendations that WHO is giving, there is nothing new. There is no intervention that is new. It's the approach of how we do the interventions we know before. So what do you do? It means you have to change the approach. And the only way to do that is training, 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 training. It's so amazing that people have so much difficulty in changing their habits. But then as, champ as, as leaders, we need to get them to do that. And the other thing is champions, unique champions. And who are these champions? Champions are people within your own system that decide to take up this personally and ensure that it is done. So they're the ones that push people to do it. They're the ones that you can get information from. They're the ones that mentor you. They're the ones that supervise you. And then, of course, audit and feedback. I said there were key considerations in the recommendations. And really, all the things I've been saying are part of the key recommendations, making sure things are available, making sure you have your strategies in place, making sure that you updated your national guidelines, making sure that, you know, all these things, training, 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 training. But there are two things that I wanted to bring forth, which is respectful maternity care. Please, let's provide respectful maternity care. WHO emphasized that over and over and over again. And then good communication. In fact, good communication between you and your colleagues. If you don't have good communication, you go and give a wrong treatment. And then good communication between you and the patient. And then between you and the relatives of the patient. So please, let's abide by you know, these key considerations that were there. Now, I wanted to go very briefly. I think I have just about four minutes more uh, or even less, uh, just to let you know that this, the result of the emotive that had made people to actually put it into the recommendations. We were in 80 hospitals across uh, uh, four countries, uh, mainly in Africa, but Nigeria had half of those uh, facilities. We're in 41 facilities in Nigeria. So the emotive data that the world is using, half of it is Nigerian data. And that really shows that if we don't roll out this and ensure that we implement the new WHO guidelines, people will leave us behind. And we are the ones that provided the data. So it becomes, you know, it becomes something that is mandatory for us to ensure that, you know, the new recommendations of WHO is implemented in every single facility in, 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 in this country. The result, the intervention, half of the centers, like in Nigeria, 19 of the centers where, where intervention 19 were, were, were uh, control and three were adaptive sites. In the whole uh, four countries, we had, uh, we had 40 uh, in interventions and 40 in, in control. And this table shows that they were equal in every respect, in the numbers of deliveries, in the numbers, the, the uh, ages of the women, in uh, parity, in cesarean section, in, in uh, abruptio placenta, everything they were similar. The only difference is that in the intervention, we had 794 uh, uh, PM, women that had severe PPH out of 48,000 deliveries, giving us 1.6%. Whilst in the usual care, we had 2,139 out of the 50,000 deliveries, and that was 4.3%. That is a 60% reduction. Statistical. Now, another thing was that when we started, both the control and the intervention had about the same percentage of severe PPH, and that was hovering around 4%. You can see that the green is the intervention. By the time we spent seven months, just seven months doing this intervention, we had brought down the PPH, severe PPH rate from 4 to 1.6. And for the control, it was still hovering the same thing. Even though, you know, when you're doing a research, people tend to do better. But you can see it was still hovering at 4%. So this shows that if right now, if we're going to check in this site, they're no more having severe PPH. We're continuing to take data. They're no more having severe PPH because they're implementing a, a complete in promoting. The PPH in terms of 500 mils, detecting PPH, 93% of the time they were detected in the intervention, while in the control, only 50%. So 50% of the people that had PPH were not detected in the control. While in the intervention, we had 93%. And in terms of using the bundle, 
A, of course, in the intervention, we train them to use the bundle. So 91% of them use the bundle. But in the intervention, in the control, of course, we didn't train them. So the use was only 19%. So some people had the idea that maybe when you put tranexamic acid and oxytocin, it will work better. But only one out of five did that. But when we train, 91% of them actually used it. And then, of course, this are secondary or the secondary uh, outcome that really shows the difference, even maternal mortality. Even though we didn't go looking for reduction in maternal mortality, but there was a 20 to 30% reduction in maternal mortality between the intervention and uh, uh, the, 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 the control. So, ladies and gentlemen, what remains is for you if you go now and Google new WHO recommendations for PPH, you will see the complete recommendation. And if you go through it with this short time that I've had, you really understand what the two recommendations, they're just two recommendations, actually. All right, just two recommendations. What they mean, how they got to where they are, and how we can help implement it. And of course, you can also Google the actual uh, 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 trial result, which is in the New England Journal of Medicine that was published in that same May that we made uh, uh, the, the, the results, uh, uh, you know, we made the results available uh, 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 for, for people to know about the, the emotive trial. So you can Google it, also Google it, read it so that you can understand, because you're really our advocates, you're really our champions. Uh, I mean, fetal maternal specialists are our champions, and we have to really use you as resources really push the agenda of getting the WHO recommendation in every single facility uh, in Nigeria. In fact, they're looking at how they can even get it to primary health care uh, facilities once they have midwives that are there. And the federal government of Nigeria is very willing. And uh, the minister has said it openly that he will do all, it, all, all that will take him with the support of partners to actually roll out, uh, you know, the the WHO uh, recommendations. We're already developing a uh, uh, national PPH uh, guideline. We've never had one. We'll be using Sogon PPH uh, uh, protocol and uh, uh, guidelines. So right now, there are consultants that are working to develop the first national uh, uh, PPH uh, guideline stroke uh, protocol. So once we have that, and we have this training of emotive brain, I think at the end of the day, having severe PPH or death from severe PPH will become the, the thing of the past. So my conclusion is that early detection and treatment of PPH using the motive bundle is the new uh, WHO guideline. And therefore, we need to put our hands together to ensure that we implement it. Thank you very much. I want to thank Afexit uh, and specifically Professor Jamil for getting across to me uh, to give me the opportunity to do this uh, uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, I'm sure we'll all agree that uh, this is the full meaning of um, hearing from the horse's mouth, uh, bearing in mind that indeed, uh, Professor Ganadenshi is among the researchers that um, generated this evidence and had this um, got WHO to quickly make this make uh, update its recommendation, which as she rightly mentioned, uh, is a record. So we really thank you so much. We really appreciate. Uh, we'll give you a small time to take some water. And um, <laughs> just to say that uh, we had one small technical challenge during the presentation. And that is the fact that uh, unfortunately, the system couldn't take more than 100 participants. Uh, that is really, uh, not how we planned it, but we, our technical team could not understand why. So we're recording this, uh, and at the end of it all, we'll explain how people can have access to this presentation. Uh, so like I said, we'll give uh, Prof some little time, and I'll hand over to the Secretary of Affairs, Dr. Bolurin Ehalae, to make a short presentation. Uh, Dr. Bolurin, are you with us? Okay, hello, please. All right. Well, while he's working on this uh, presentation, uh, we have, like I said, uh, we can all um, 
uh, note our questions on the chat box. And uh, there is one already uh, for you, uh, Prof. Galadenchi. And the question is, how available are the drapes and how much they cost? So we will okay. start with that, please. Okay, so when we started uh, the um, e emotive and we realized that this is something that we might have to implement uh, later, we engaged a local uh, manufacturer uh, and uh, they, they produced, we showed them the, uh, the Indian uh, version. The Indian version costs about uh, $1.5 and by the time you bring it with a cost of uh, 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 importation and so on, it might even get to more than uh, $2. So, so we needed to make it available here in Nigeria. And so right now in Kano, uh, we have a company that is producing it and uh, they've produced like two, three, two, three, four versions. And each time they bring to us, we try it so that we can give them a feedback so that they can get it uh, better. So right now we have one that is almost perfect and is the one that we're trying to see if they can produce enough uh, uh, for us to be able to, uh, uh, you know, use it uh, across across uh, uh, the places where it is required. Uh, they, of course, they're trying to see if they can even automate it, because right now it's not automated. But they can, they're trying to see if they can automate it. And of course, also it's leather. And you know, in terms of climate, uh, they don't, we don't like so much leather. Even the leather we have is enough for us. So now you're going to be using leather for every uh, delivery. So actually, we're looking at even getting biodegradable leather. So that even when you put it on the ground, it becomes sand. So it's biodegradable. So, so but that would be, you know, looking ahead, uh, what what we can do. Um, so right now we have it, and they're trying to make it cost less than a dollar, less than a dollar. That's the rate at which they're trying to get it. The first one they produced for us, they produced it at about a thousand, which is really less than a dollar right now. Uh, so I don't know if if they're able to probably. Uh, uh, Automated, it might even come down because that means they can produce more at a time and it might come down. But right now, they're producing about uh, uh, a thousand for one. Thank you very much. There's another question on whether we can have the complete emotive pack. So I don't know that there is a way uh, the complete emotive pack is available. Is there something like that? The, the, the emotive pack is what we have said. E is for early detection. And the M-O-T-I-V-E is the interventions. So the, the, the bundle, which is the motive bundle, is that you give all this intervention, which means you do massage, you, do ox you give oxytocin. And remember, it's oxytocin. So if you like, if it's oxytocin, you have to give oxytocin. If you like, give misoprostol. If you like, give the two. Now, cabetosin, heat stable cabetosin is also being tried to see whether it will work in the bundle. But you know, for now, heat stable cabetosin is for prevention. It's not used for treatment. But there are studies going on to see whether it can also work for treatment. So if, it's all, if it also works for treatment, it means you can give it instead of oxytocin. Then give your tranexamic acid. Make sure there is an IV line going on. And make sure that you examine if the bleeding doesn't stop examining and escalate. So that's the bundle. So it's nothing like a pack, it's a bundle. And keep it in such a way that it is easily accessible. You know, there are times, especially weekend, that things can be stored in the store and you don't find it. You want to use transdemic acid, you have it, but it's, 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 it's already in a key. And uh, even after working hours, somebody might have locked it and then you don't have it available. We don't want it there. It has to be accessible and available to every healthcare provider that wants to use. Yes, so uh, talking about its availability, are there things that um, one can do to, you know, to make all the components more available than they, are, than they usually are? Yeah, so, so what, I, what I think, first of all, is that as we need to involve our policymakers, we need to involve our leaders, right? Now, first of all, even the drips, uh, the government, I've heard the minister himself saying that, he will do whatever it takes to make drips available in Nigeria. So if he's going to support to make that available, it means we have one of the components of the, of the WHO recommendations. Uh, oxytocin, we need quality oxytocin. During our trial, we actually tested 14 brands of oxytocin across our 40 sites. And there were only two brands that were good. 
I think there was something like Sintocinone and Rotex. They were the only two brands that had enough oxytocin inside them. All the other brands had lower than the quantity that is required. So as leaders in our various health facilities, we should do advocacy to our management to tell them that these are the things we require. When you're going to source for oxytocin, these are the brands we require. And please, you tell your label ward matron, she has to have transdemic acid oxytocin in the label ward, not in the pharmacy. We have to make sure that all these are available in the label ward, not in the pharmacy. Right now, in most hospitals, transdemic acid is available, but in the pharmacy. They should be, just as they keep oxytocin in the label ward, they should keep transdemic acid in the label ward. You can, even where you pay, you can charge a patient after using it. But at least it should be there when you need it. So I feel we need to, we need to engage our stakeholders and our stakeholders are our policy makers, the women themselves, all healthcare providers, the managers, everybody, so that collectively not one person can do it. We as obstetricians alone cannot implement the WHO recommendations if we don't have the buy-in of the major stakeholders here. And that's the ministry people, the, 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 the managers, the mid, midwives, the midwife association, the midwives in our hospital. Everybody has to come together if we really want to implement uh, this WHO recommendation. And one important thing is that we're having a national guideline that will support, which is a policy document that will support the Okay, the calibrated drips, are they yeah. only for spontaneous vaginal deliveries? Can yeah. they be used for objective assessment of blood loss from cesarean section or is it only for vaginal delivery? A very good question because it was stated in the WHO recommendation that they think having an objective assessment of blood loss in cesarean section is something good. It's clearly stated in the, in the, in the recommendation, all right? So actually, because they've also noticed there's a delay because you're doing cesarean section, you don't realize that a woman has lost so much blood. By the time you realize it's too, too late, even when you give her blood transfusion. So there should be an objective way, even though in, in cesarean section, we suck the blood. So somehow we have a bit of an objective way, but there are some that are on the floor, on the, on the drips and so on and so forth. So they mentioned it in the recommendation that they think uh, uh, there, there, there should be the use of something objective to assess blood loss in their section so that we can also institute treatment early. There are studies that are going on, and I'm sure we will have, we will have recommendations coming out of this study. Thank you very much. Uh, please, what is the role of anti-shock garments? Uh, does it continue to play a role or has it been discarded? Anti-shock garment is still yes. part of it. When do you, when you want to escalate, if a woman has lost so much blood, you can't even resuscitate her. And that's why you see, if you do the early detecting, you might not get her there, but there's still some that will have refractory bleeding. I will not tell you hundred percent that you get every single one to stop bleeding immediately. Those that have refractory bleeding, those are the ones that need a tissue garment. Supposing we're now saying go to the primary health care where you have midwives, you can only do emotive where you have midwives. When you have community health workers or you have uh, environmental health workers, you can't do emotive. You can't implement the, the, the recommendation. But when you have a midwife and she is in a primary health care setting and then she has getting to that E when a woman is still bleeding and she's not able to stop it with a motive trial, she will put the, the, the anti-shock garment to the, uh, to the woman and then refer her so that the woman will be alive when she reaches the next level of care. If she doesn't put it, the woman will continue to bleed and then by the time she gets to the healthcare, you will now certify her dead in the, in the car, all right, in the ambulance. So we need anti-shock garment. You know what? In all our 40 sites, anti-shock garment is on that trolley as part of the whole bundle of care. So when you go, get to E, if you need to use anti-shock garment, use anti-shock garment. It is still a life-saving intervention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, there is a question about oxytocin. What is the problem that the right oxytocin is not in the market or is not being manufactured in Nigeria? So it's, it's, not, it's not that the right oxytocin is not there. You see, one of the most important thing in oxytocin is the whole chain. So wherever oxytocin is produced, if they don't adhere to the cold chain, 
the, by the time it gets to the patient, it doesn't have the efficacy it, 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 it requires. So if we, if we import oxytocin, which I'm sure we do, it stays in Lagos, Lagos stove. In fact, when they're bringing it, I don't know whether they put it in a cold chain. And then it stays in Lagos stove. And you can imagine if that has 24 hours of, 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 of light, of power to, make sure, to, to ensure the, uh, uh, the, the cold chain. Then from there, it, it gets, at times it gets to the market, secondary market, and stays for months before you and I go to buy it. And then we buy it from the shelf. You don't know the story of somebody was there as a professional. He got to a pharmacy and then somebody came to collect oxytocin. And then he saw the pharmacist just picking the oxytocin from the shelf. And then he told the pharmacist, how dare you? Don't you know that the oxytocin is supposed to be cold? The man said, I'm sorry, sir. You took the oxytocin, put it in the fridge. And after about five, 10 minutes, he said, now you can have the oxytocin. It is cold now. Hey, that's the mentality. Of course, it has stopped. It has, the, the, the potency has gone. So that is what we're doing. When we buy it, even when it's been kept at 40 degrees, we buy it and keep it in our fridge in the labor ward. It's no more, it's no more potent. Uh, so we need to, we need the heat. Uh, uh, and that's why a heat stable carbohydrate scene is something that is very important for us because that's an alternative. You can put it at 30 degrees, 40 degrees, and it's still warm. And it's the same oxytocin. Okay, so, so considering your last statement, if one has both carbetocin and oxytocin, uh, should one then use carbetocin? If, if it is for prevention, I said right now, carbetocin, heat stable carbetocin is only recommended for prevention. If you have oxytocin and you're not sure of the potency of oxytocin, I advise you to use heat stable carbetocin if you're not sure of the potency of the oxytocin. All right, but for motive trial, what we use is oxytocin. And now there are studies that are being done to see can you replace oxytocin with heat stable carbetocin for the all in motive trial. So we wait for results. You see, the thing is evidence based. So you don't just think of something and decide you take it as an intervention. It has to be evidence based. So we will wait and see. Heat stable carbetocin is part of the recommendation of WHO for prevention of PPH. And it is there in our 2012 uh, WHO recommendation for prevention of PPH. But for treatments, it is oxytocin. The oral is oxytocin, all right? So we wait for the results of the heat stable capitocin to be used for treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, bearing in mind your position in, on these guidelines and also in the country, are there plans for training of health workers on this uh, updated uh, guideline and the emotive uh, bundle, use of the yes. emotive bundle? Yes, there, there are plans for really rolling out emotive across the country. And there are many partners in it. The biggest partner is the Federal Ministry of Health. And this was said by the minister himself. And after that, the Federal Ministry of Health is on the driving seat. All our training documents are going to be nationally adopted. Now, there are many partners. We as Emotive and AFPA were using our hop site. All the 40 sites where we did Emotive, we're going to use them as hop site. They are going to be the ones training other centers. So I go to Oweri, all right? And I have a site in Oweri. I don't need to come from Kano and go and tra train in Oweri. We already have trainers in Oweri, and we're going to use those trainers to train other facilities in Oweri. We have trainers in Kebi. Federal Medical Center Kebi was one of our sites. So we can use Federal Medical Center Kebi to train other facilities in Kebi. Now for us as ASPAP, we're going to use each of our sites to train five more facilities. So within the couple of months, we're going to start that. And with that, we're going to get to 200 facilities across Nigeria. Other, other partners, WH, WH, I haven't heard from WHO, but UNICEF, Pathfinder, uh, 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 TA Connect, uh, Gates Foundation, every one of them have all agreed that they are going to train in their various sites. And do you know who they are going to use? They will use the same trainers that we have. 
So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to go and do a TOT again in Abuja. We already have trainers. In each state they want to use, they will use the trainers that we all have. So I'm sure there are some people that are trainers here, like uh, Dr. Higa. Uh, uh, he, he is from, uh, he, his site was one of our sites. We will use his site to train people in Benin. So ladies and gentlemen, many of you were actually our trainers and we're going to be getting back to you to do more training and implementation for Emotive, uh, for the, for the uh, adoption and the implementation of the WHO uh, recommendation. So that is the plan. So really, we are really trying to roll out uh, the, 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 the guideline, uh, the WHO guideline. And that's why we even need a national guideline, which already is on its way to. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor Galadenchi. Uh, unfortunately, this um, limitation of 200 participants has really caused us a lot of um, okay. problem, including the speaker, the, the, the second speaker who was supposed to speak for five minutes. Uh, actually, he was kicked out too. Uh, <laughs> we really apologize for that. Um, so uh, I don't know. Let me just uh, catch somebody. Please bear with me, Professor Raji. I think Raji is with us. We just want a one minute, I mean, uh, will I say talk about how people can join at FEMSON. Professor Raji, sorry for catching you off guard. I know you can do that. Uh, are you with us, Professor Raji? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Professor Galadinchi. Thanks for that beautiful um, presentation. Yes, so FEMSON is the Association of Phytomaternal Medicine Specialists of Nigeria. It is affiliated to SOGON. And then we have full membership. We have two categories of membership. We have the full membership and we have the associate membership. The full membership is for obstetrician and gynecologists across the, the, the country and some, we even have some in the diaspora. And then associate membership is for um, other health workers like um, pediatricians, like uh, midwives, um, radiologists, and other people that are interested in helping us to improve our fetal maternal medicine indices in the, in the country. So to join our FEMSIN is very simple. You, you, you visit our website, www.afemsin.org. I'm going to quickly type that in the, in the chat box. There's a, a one-off membership fee that is paid. Um, I think for full members, it's, uh, I think it's 10,000 for full membership. And the half of that for, no, the annual due is 10,000 for full members and half of that for associate members. That's 5,000 for associate members. And then there's a one-off payment too that is made. And then once you join us, you're going to have the benefit of having your membership certificate. Um, so we encourage you to join. We all have ours. At least those of us that are full members have a, we're both full and associate members have a membership certificate, which is a very, very beautiful certificate that you can, you know, frame and display on your, on your consulting room, your facility. Um, and then, yes, let me also invite you to our forthcoming conference in Port Harcourt, we're going to be sharing the flyers on the on the on our website on our WhatsApp group. But you also find details about the conference on the website. The conference is going to be in July this year. So we have members across the six geopolitical zones in the country, and we also have some yeah, um, majorly obstetricians and resident doctors. But so we're hoping to get um, other partners, like the pediatricians I talked about, the radiologists and also the midwives to come on board and join us. So the website is available on the chat box. If you're interested in more information, you can quickly go there. I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for this. So that's what I can give at such short notice. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Prof. Raji. That was quite educative. Um, and most importantly, the website is um, where we'll put up this presentation. Actually, uh, we have social media bundle. I, I mean, a social, I'm saying bundle. Social media <laughs> handle. Yes, the emotive bundle has rolled up on you. <laughs> social media handle. So uh, we put this on Facebook, uh, I mean, this presentation. And so for those of us that have not been able to join, please, you have opportunity, go to our website and you uh, get the link to uh, watch and listen to this presentation. Uh, I really want to thank the speaker. Uh, I remember a comment she made at the United Nations where she and our president, uh, Professor Afolabi, represented us. And she mentioned the fact that um, 
just using research, you can impact a lot on many, many people. And I think this kind of research is a demonstration of that uh, because uh, it's about to change how we we'll manage women with PPH, uh, reducing the number of deaths and morbidity among our mothers. So I think this is a very good demonstration of that statement. And I really uh, thank you for this uh, important initiative. Uh, briefly, I would like to call on our past president, uh, Professor Etuk, to help me come and thank the speaker. So, Professor Etuk, sir, are you with us? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Let me appreciate all those who have joined today. I know that we have had a larger number than this, but for these limitations that we have, and we strongly apologize for that. I don't know how to start thanking this kind of worldwide recognized lady and member of FMC. Well, let me make an attempt. But <laughs> since, she, <laughs> since she's part of us, whatever I say, she will accept it. Well, I, I don't think it can be better. She has given us from first hand what we're expecting. I'm not sure there is anybody in this midst that will live the way he or she came in. We are all well educated. So, Madam, you are wonderful. You have done it very well. And we don't know what to say, except to say that thank you because you are the owner of FMC. And FMC has come. FMC cannot, be, cannot do late. So we thank you for all that you have been doing. You have been representing us all over the world. And today you have shown us that you are capable of doing it. I would rather appreciate join the, my past secretary to say everybody here should key into FMC. We did. We have a lot to gain. Thank you very much. Let me also thank our first vice president. He has recognized me and he has represented us well. And all the members of FMC here present and the new members I'm seeing who are joining us now. Thank you very much and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, our teacher, speaker, and uh, all the distinguished uh, teachers, senior colleagues, colleagues, students, resident doctors, nurses, other health workers that have joined us. We hope uh, it's something that uh, you found educative. And most importantly, we look forward to you utilizing this information uh, to improve your skills and knowledge on uh, management of postpartum hemorrhage hoping that this will help to reduce <clears throat> maternal morbidity and mortality. So thank you all for joining us. We look forward to another webinar. And uh, by God's grace, we'll, look, we'll improve on our shortcomings uh, against next time. So thank you. So thank much you very everybody. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, our speaker. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.